The last time we spoke about the different vrittis, that is, the ripples in the lake of the mind are classified into five types. We will just briefly recap that. The first is correct cognition. That is seeing something and recognizing it for what it is. I'll use an example of the, a dog. A dog is recognized by everybody. You see a dog, you know this is a dog. It may be brown, it may be black, it may be small, it may be big, it may be of a different kind of a breed without much hair or a dog that's very furry. But irrespective of the kind of dog it is, we all recognize that it is a dog. The second kind of cognition is incorrect, which means you see a dog, but you don't see recognize it to be a dog. You think it is some kind of a monster. Why? Because you have a coloring. Perhaps when you were young or child or some time back, you were bitten by a dog. And since then, you are very afraid of dogs. So whenever you see a dog, you don't in fact see a dog. You just see a terrible, aggressive creature who is now going to come and bite you. That is incorrect cognition. Incorrect cognition is very often is due to the coloring in the mind. The second kind, sorry, the third kind is vikalp or imagination. We can take the same example of a dog. We can start imagining stories around an imaginary dog. That would be very creative. In art, for example, you take many animals and make little designs out of it. For example, peacocks are a well-known motive in Indian art. You'll see them sometimes on saris as well or on furniture. They're very decorative. So you can imagine designs out of things. This is creative. It's very useful. We take the idea of a dog again and we say, concept, dog is a man's best friend. This tells us about concepts like loyalty and friendship. These concepts also have no basis in reality. They do not have any concrete form. They are abstract. These are also useful. Other ideas such as truth, freedom, wisdom, they all are useful but have no concrete reality. The fourth kind of vritti is deep dreamless sleep. And that we experience in the latent unconscious mind. Every night you go through cycles of dreaming and deep dreamless sleep. And in dreaming state is also a kind of imagination. But deep dreamless state, there is no con content. And that is also a kind of vritti. Memory is recalling all other forms of cognition. whether real or imagined, but without adding anything from any other source. So if I tell you a story about a dog, and you can recall the same story again without any, adding anything to that story, then that's memory. 
or you recall an event which happened this morning, for instance, you repeat it, you are able to recall that memory without adding anything from any other form. You're not adding your own little imagination to it. If you're adding your imagination to it, it's no longer memory, it is imagination. This idea of memory is very interesting because we may have had instances where two people went through the same experience but they both recall it in different ways because we have different perceptions. We cognize things differently, we add color to it and our imagination gets involved and so the stories sound different, even though both the persons went through the same experience. So why do we need to know about Vrittis? Why are we studying the Vrittis? There's one important reason for that. And that is, you can see from the diagram, that between the conscious mind and the center of consciousness, there is the, the uncharted territory of active and latent unconscious mind. So this is the reason why we need to study the mind because it's not possible to simply go over it, to skip over it. You need to go through it. And when you go through it, you need to know the terrain. It's like a battlefield in which you need to know whom you're fighting with. So you need to know what you're dealing with in the unconscious mind, as well as the conscious mind. You need to know what, what are the constituents of the mind. This is what the mind is made up of. You get to know yourself. The shortest way to center of consciousness, to enlightenment, is to know yourself. And that is why we study the nature of the mind in the Yoga Sutras. Any questions so far? Okay, I think everybody is fine. In that case, I will continue. Now that we have summarized the first part, we come to a very interesting part, a very practical part of the Yoga Sutras. And that is practice and non-attachment. These are the verses 12 to 16 in chapter 1. Verse 12 says, With practice and non-attachment, the ripples of thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires that disturb the lake of the mind subside.
question, verses 13 and 14 answer the question, what is meant by practice? Effort and energy applied repeatedly to attain the state where the ripples of mind subside is called practice. And the practice becomes firm when it is continued over a long period of time without break and with the right attitude. If we would like to attain the state of yoga in which the ripples of the mind subside and we can see through to our real nature, that is pure consciousness, we cannot generally see our true nature because these ripples on the lake of the mind disturb us. But with practice and non-attachment, <clears throat> these do subside. These ripples are vrittis, the vrittis subside. And pure consciousness shines forth. Practice is called abhyasa in Sanskrit and non-attachment is vairagya. Think of these two as wings of a bird. If yoga is a bird, it has two wings, abhyasa and vairagya. Can a bird fly with only one wing? No. So we need to have both. We need to do practice, abhyasa as well as vairagya. Abhyasa is that effort or energy that you apply. If you do not put in effort or do not put in energy, very little is going to happen. It is true that we evolve even though we do not do any practice. But evolution is a natural process. We will evolve spiritually. But the question is, how long that will take? That can take hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. There are scriptures that say it takes 84 lakh human lifetimes to be enlightened if one does nothing. No abhyasa. 84 lakhs is um, 840,000, I think. <laughs> it's a lot. So, if you want to evolve sooner, faster, if you want to get out of this bondage of suffering, pain and pleasure, then you need to do some effort. And that effort must be applied repeatedly, not one time, but repeatedly. Repeatedly, that's the key word here. It's very important. To attain that state where the ripples of the mind subside. That state is also called sthiti. This abhyasa becomes firm when it is continued over a long period of time without break and with the right attitude. So there are three criteria. For a long time, without break and with the right attitude. So some of you are meditating, some of you are uh, being guided by me and we do this process where I have told all of you that it's very important to meditate four times a day and if that's not possible at least twice a day and to do that over a long period of time without breaks which means 
you could just do it for a couple of days, then for another week you do nothing, and then again do it very intensely for two weeks, and then for two months you do nothing. That, unfortunately, is how that happens most of the time. A lot of seekers start out with a great deal of ambition, with, with very good resolutions, but find that it's very hard for them to keep up these good thoughts in practice. And what happens is that they become very irregular. So verse 1.14 from the Yoga Sutras is very important for us because Abhyasa becomes firm when it is continued over a long period of time without break and with the right attitude. What is the right attitude? That attitude which is, that practice which does not come out of arrogance or ego. No, it's not an egoism, nor is it escapism. You're not trying to run away from the world and sit in your little room or your ashram or wherever and brood alone. If that is a kind of escapism, then that's not the right attitude. If you're trying to show off to others what a spiritual person I am, that too is not the right attitude. So, these three criteria are very important. To practice over a long period of time, to practice without breaks, and with the right attitude. So what are we practicing? What is that abhyas about? What are we practicing? You can say we're practicing sitting, meditation, observing the breath, pranayam, asanas, all these things. But in reality, what a meditator is practicing is non-attachment. We are learning to withdraw our minds from the objects of the world. It does not necessarily mean that we do not use those objects, but we no longer are attached to them. These objects are no longer colored. We withdraw our minds from them, we withdraw our energies from them, we can even withdraw from the external world simply by, by going inward and dealing with the internal objects. That is also one of the levels, the first earlier levels. And eventually we learn to withdraw energy from the object itself. That means it is uncolored. We're learning how to uncolor the objects, to make klishta objects a klishta. That is what we are practicing. So, this is called Vairagya. Verse 15 talks about this, explains. When the mind is neither attracted to the external world nor desires higher states or powers described in scriptures, this state of desirelessness is called non attachment. So that is what we are practicing to do to uncolor these external objects. So that we don't, so the mind does not keep going towards these objects. 
Nor should we do this for the purpose of gaining powers. That will be described in chapter 3 of the Yoga Sutras, the Siddhis. This state of desirelessness is called non-attachment or vairagya. Any questions about Abhyasa and Vairagya? Okay. Besides Vairagya, there is a still higher state called Param Vairagya. This is explained by verse 16. When we recognize that the thoughts mental images, emotions and desires, as well as the entire external world, the gunas, everything, is all transient, all changing, constantly changing. And that our true nature is pure consciousness. When we realize this, this is supreme non-attachment, param vairagya. This is quite a high state, and we may not be able to relate to this, but think of this as, think of the time when you were a child. You were very small, you had a different kind of body. It was very, very small, it was different. Then you became a, a teenager, adolescent. You, be, you matured further, you became an adult. As you grow older, you will become old and you will age until you are really extremely old and uh, unable to do things for yourself. It seems hard to imagine right now. But the body was continuously changing. Yet, something in you was constant. Because even though the body changed, there is a part which remained constant. And that is the understanding that that part is pure consciousness, the part that remained constant. Everything else changed. Your thoughts changed, your ideas changed. Even your surrounding has completely changed. You stayed earlier with your family, with your siblings, maybe now you have a different family, totally different friends. You have different interests from the time you were a adolescent and it's quite possible that in future 10 years from now 20 years from now you will again be surrounded by different people perhaps you will have children or even grandchildren you will have other friends your surroundings will look totally different you don't know what the future will look like but at the rate that technology is going, it's very likely that it's going to look quite different. So everything is changing, but yet something will be in you. Also 20 years from now, that is with you right now. And that is pure consciousness. And when you experience this all the time, constantly, this realization, through direct experience, that is Param Vairagya.
So, Abhyasa and Vairagya ultimately lead to Param Vairagya. Any questions or thoughts about Abhyasa and Vairagya or Param Vairagya? Okay, in that case, we go to the levels of meditation. This is very interesting, especially for those of you who are practicing some kind of meditation. So what happens with Abhyasa and Vairagya? You attain higher level of meditation. So basically, verse 17 tells us that there are four levels of meditation depending on the object. So the first level is called Vitarka. <clears throat> In this, the object of meditation is normally very gross. So those of you who do rituals, that is a gross form of meditation. Things like external lights, focusing on external lights, or um, chanting mantras loudly, having a visual, a photo for example. Some people like to meditate upon the photo of, the, of a teacher, a guru, or a deity of sorts. So all these are external gross objects. So this is a gross object. And that is called Vitarka. Let us take the example of the mother. When you think of mother, your own mother, you can meditate upon, say, her photo. You can think about it, contemplate on her photo or the real person. That would be Vitarka. I'm using an example of mother because it's it, it works very well here. The subtler object is called vichara, and these are internal meditation practices in the mind. You could also use a mantra silently in your mind. Now, if you are meditating on the mother, then you would not use the photo anymore that you would contemplate on the mental image of your mother. Okay, and that would be vichara. The third level is ananda. It becomes so subtle, the meditation, it goes to level of feeling. It captures the essence of that object that is meditated upon. And so if the object of meditation was your mother, that image of your mother, which is in your mind, might just dissolve and all you're left with is a beautiful feeling of love because that captures the essence of your mother. You can do the same with another object. For example, you think about the first time you fell in love when you were infatuated with some person maybe from your school or your neighborhood. It's a young teenager. The mind completely, continuously contemplates on this person, the first love. And you... Uh, have um, the person in front of you, you want to be with this person all the time, that would be Vitarka. And when you're away from the person, your loved one, then you always have the 
image of that person in the mind, the thought of the person. We may not necessarily be saying the person's name, but you have the image of that person in your mind. And then, as you keep contemplating on that person, you feel a deep sense of love. Maybe it's mixed with some pain also, the pain of separation. But that is ananda. That is the bhava. That is why many spiritual stories have been the stories of erotic love. For example, the stories of um, Radha and Krishna. This, these are not actually erotic stories, but it is the beloved, the lover and the beloved, that is the Lord or, and the devotee. So these are symbols. But you can see how that applies even in the levels of concentration. So when you capture that sense of your beloved, you experience ananda. The fourth level is asmita. That is when that false sense of identity disappears and your true nature is unveiled. You go back to the example of the mother. You think of the photo or your real mother. Then you go to the mental image of mother. Then you experience that love. And then it goes still deeper. It expands to universal love, to unconditional love. It tears apart all that false identity of mother and child and goes beyond to universal love where you experience this unconditional love for all beings. That is asmata. That's in highest, one of the highest levels of meditation where these smaller identities that begin to that limit us start dissolving. So the object itself became irrelevant because the object that you took of your mother, the photo, as well as the mental image, seemed to dissolve and you were left with love which expanded into unconditional universal love. It seems like objectless. But far subtler than this, is the state of asambra, asamprajata samadhi, which is objectless meditation. And this is attained through constant, unbroken practice of supreme non-attachment. That means that at all times you know that the external world and all the ripples of thoughts are transient and that your true nature is nothing other than pure consciousness. You know it all the time. And this is the highest state and it is called asam prajata samadhi. It's objectless. When there is an object, like in the earlier four states, we talked about in our example using the object of mother. But in the objectless, even that disappears and expands further. In the concentration with object, the knowledge you Acquire is always in parts, but in objectless samadhi, it is knowledge of the whole, because now you identify with none other than pure consciousness. So if you use our example here, 
half our picture to make this a little bit more clear. <clears throat> Most of you know this picture very well. Most people identify here the level of objects in the external world. Some people identify with objects outside, but the others with the senses itself or the body itself. Or you identify with the mind. So, for example, if you're a doctor, you identify with the idea of being a doctor. If you're a lawyer, you identify with the idea of being a lawyer. So you identify with these roles. That's the mind. But when you begin to identify here at the level of center of consciousness, which is right at the end, you see, you look out of center of consciousness, then you see that everything is external. The whole world, the mind itself becomes external. Therefore, you have knowledge of the whole. But if you are still at the level of mind and you look out, you will see the body, you will see the senses, you will see external objects, and you will always have only part knowledge. Any questions so far about this? I hope that you are following this. If there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask. You may feel some of these ideas are a bit difficult. I have made um, really a lot of effort to try to simplify it and help you to be able to relate to these ideas by using these examples that you can all relate to. Okay. This brings us. Hello. Brings us, Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, I'm having like some problems with this audio today. Yeah. Uh, okay. My question. Yeah, my question is like I don't know whether. This is the right question or not, but like uh, I've got like some curiosity. Um, you said like there are four levels of meditation, and uh, in that four levels of meditation, uh, the one which we are doing like uh, during our meditation, like uh, watching our breath at the nasarga, is it uh, like vitarka? It does that comes under that? What do you think? Uh, did, Yes, because like uh, we are still in the, uh, I don't know, that's why, <laughs> hello? Yeah, well think about it, is it vichara, is it internal, is it something that you cannot grasp, like uh, an object in the mind or a silent mantra? It's... Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Can you repeat it again? Like, I'm having some disturbances. Okay. okay. Is breath in the mind? Um, I think, like, we are... Yes, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's not an image in the mind, right? 
images in the mind or in this a, a silent mantra. Let's say you can repeat slowly in your mind without moving your mouth. You can hear it in your mind. The breath is not in the mind, but it okay. is not exactly the body either. It's a transition between the external mm -hmm. and the internal, which is why the breath is used to lead us inward. But it is not in still. It is external because it's at the level of the body. To go okay. to the level of vichara, you have to leave the breath behind. You forget the breath. And you then just focusing on the mental objects. Whether the mental object is, oh. in my example, I use the mother. So you focus on the, the, the photo, the image of the mother. It could be a deity. It could be a mantra. It could be some sort of a visual. But that would be an internal object. Okay, so it is uh, in the level of like uh, Vidarka. Yes, it's definitely more gross, right? So it would come under the okay. You can you can feel the breath, okay. right? You can feel the breath. Mm, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. The next part is about the efforts and commitment. These are the verses 19 to 22 of chapter 1. And we see from verse 19 that some people attain a higher state of consciousness simply because of impressions from previous lifetimes. So they have put their effort in another lifetime and therefore in this lifetime, they experience higher levels of consciousness or states of consciousness as a kind of a merit, you can say. They experience that. But everybody else must have faith, have indomitable will and energy, constant mem remembrance, experience of samadhi and higher, the direct knowledge of higher state, that is, objectless samadhi, to attain objectless samadhi. So let's understand each of these things. What is faith? Faith is believing in the invisible, that is, consciousness. We keep talking about pure consciousness all the time, and we say Purusha, Atman, we give it different names, pure consciousness, the self, many names for this, but it is invisible. Nobody has seen it. So how can you believe in that? The well, one thing is that we have a trust. We believe in the scriptures. We trust them that the sages have seen something. They were seers, so they've had a direct experience of this. And so we take their word for it. But that is more or less blind faith, right? They have said it and I believe it. But what about a deaf man? If you tell a deaf person, you write it and give it to him, you say there's such a thing as music. He's read about it. He said, oh, there's such a wonderful thing as music. Oh, it's harmonious and it's describing music in words. Can you imagine trying to describe music in words to a deaf person? That's almost impossible, isn't it? But that is exactly what the scriptures are trying to do. Trying to des describe this beauty to somebody who has not seen it, who has not had a direct experience of it. Now, how can you convince the deaf person that there is really something like music? Well, you all may have seen this. You have all experienced it. If you put on the music really loud, especially music 
which has got a lot of drums and things, and you put your hand against the speaker, you can feel it, you can feel the vibration. If you play the piano or harmonium, you put your hand on the piano, you will feel the vibration of the music. So that is not direct perception. If you remember, there's also something called inference. That's also a form of cognition. You infer. You infer that, that something exists because you see its shadow. Similarly, the deaf man can infer that there is something like music because he can feel the vibration. So also, you can infer that there is something deeper than all this external world, deeper than the mind, through inference. When you see the world around you and its beauty and the wonder, then you begin to feel there's something divine, there's a higher force. When man first went to the moon, these astronauts, they went there and the first time somebody stood on the moon and looked at the earth, turned back, and they were so wonderstruck. They were so in awe of, it looked so beautiful, this blue pearl floating through space. It must have been a wondrous sight for them. It appears that almost all the astronauts who came back from the moon began to believe in a higher power. They began to believe that there is something like God, or what we would call pure consciousness, that there is something which is constant, permanent. We can also infer that from ourselves. I used this example and I said, when you were a child, your body was different. Your friends were different. Your interests were different. You played with some toys. When you became a teenager, your body changed. There were many changes, very big changes in your body. Your friends changed. Your interests changed completely. You did not want to be seen, you know, dead with, with one of those toys or these cuddly toys or, or whatever. Your interest was then in the opposite gender. As you became an adult, again, things changed. Your interests changed. You became more interested in having a career earning money, having a family, settling down, buying a house or a car, completely different. But yet something was the same. That same is pure consciousness. And so we can infer that there is something permanent in us. And that is reasoned faith. And so we must have that faith. We need to have a very strong will. If you want to do anything in life, you need to have the will. Without that, you can't achieve anything. Think about these super athletes. They train for 8-10 hours a day whether it's in football or whether it's an athletic meet or, or tennis, they train like crazy. They're not willing to give up. They put in tremendous energy. And that's the kind of will and energy you need for this. This would lead to constant remembrance. We can come back again to the example of mother and child or to that of the lover and the beloved. Go back 
to the memories of being a teenager and first time falling in love. How was the feeling? You thought about that person, your beloved, all the time. Constant remembrance. That is how great sages, yogis, everybody who wants to practice meditation is going in that direction of constant remembrance. Here, I would like to mention mantra because when we start remembering a mantra in the mind, initially it may be just very uh, like a parrot, you know, you're just internally repeating it. It may be a bit mechanical, but after a while, it, the vibrations sort of start resonating in the entire mind. It seems to take over the entire mind field. And that experience goes to emotion. And that is constant remembrance. Just like you continuously remembered your beloved as a teenager. You could not stop thinking about this person. You tried to study or you try to do something. But all you could do was remember that person you were madly in love with. The same for the mother. When she has a little infant. Whatever she's doing, she may be engaged in her housework. She may be busy cleaning, cooking. But her heart is always with her baby. She's remembering her baby all the time. That is constant remembrance. This constant remembrance leads to the experience of samadhi with object. Because that object is... Like in the example of mother and child, the object is child. In the example of lover and beloved, the object is the beloved. Similarly, you can use mantra or breath or whatever the object may be. And that experience of samadhi is then with object. And this eventually leads to the direct knowledge from objectless samadhi. So the first question um, from Stuart. Stuart asks, what's the difference between samadhi with object and objectless samadhi? We can repeat that once again. It's it's not easy, I understand. We can use one example. And that's the example of mother and child. <clears throat> the mother is thinking about her child. The child is in front of her and that's the object. And she's continuously there with the child, very focused on the child, a little baby. The baby is not there for whatever reason. Maybe the baby's sleeping, she's in the kitchen or she's doing something. She's gone out, leaving her baby in the care of somebody else, but her heart is always there with the baby. So in her mind, she's always thinking about her baby. That's Vichara. The third level, there is Ananda. So that, that love which she experienced for her baby is always in her heart. So that is still... In a sense, the object, it's, it's part knowledge. It's only related to this baby as yet. Then it seems to expand when you begin to realize somehow the separation between the mind and the seer. There's a part which begins to see who is experiencing this love. It asks, who is this who is experiencing this love? And that's when you are at Asmita, because you realize that these experiences are at the level of the mind. Pure consciousness is merely a witness. But there's still an object, and that is the mind itself. 
And now you go to objectless samadhi. And now you're identified not with the mind, but with the self, with Atman itself. And then everything becomes an object. It's not part knowledge, but entire mind field itself and the world has become an object. So there's no specific object. And that is called objectless samadhi. Just to clarify, the word object and objectless may be um, putting us in a wrong direction, misleading us. The actual words are, in Sanskrit, samprajata and asamprajata. Samprajata means to know or to discern. And asamprajata means it's more diffused. It's not accurate, but it's more diffuse. It's, it's expansion. It's having the knowledge of the whole. I, I hope that helps Stuart ultimately <laughs> one should be able to relate to the example and that, that always helps. If you cannot relate to the example, it becomes much more theoretical. So keep in mind the, the first love. I think that experience almost everybody has had. Those of you who are not mothers or have not had that experience, cannot obviously relate to the mother and child uh, example, but you can definitely relate to the first love, the infatuation. And that is exactly how it is with an object. That's why the object is very important. Yes, asmita is a samadhi with an object. Yeah. It's still not gone beyond that. But it's still a very high state because you're down to talking about identities. You're beginning to question, who am I? Who is this person who is experiencing this? So that's, that's very profound. We come to... From Shibu, mind is that which knows everything, right? That is right cognition. Deep sleep, there's no mind. You don't experience anything. So if you go beyond the mind, how do we know that? Yeah, um, deep sleep, deep dreamless sleep is not beyond the mind. Okay, let me go back to our... Favorite diagram. So this is a conscious mind. This is the waking state. Here is where mostly you have the right cognition or the wrong cognition. That is when you see things correctly or incorrectly. You make mistakes. You, you misunderstood. For example, wrong cognition is when you thought a person was your friend but it turned out that this person only wanted to use you or exploit you, wanted something from you and was being nice to you. So you, you did not see his true nature, his true character. That was wrong cognition. A right cognition is when you see through the person's ulterior motives and you say, aha, this is not a good person. That is right cognition. So these two, right and wrong cognition, that happens at the level of conscious mind. Then comes imagination, partly, which is also in the active level of the unconscious mind, dream state. But partly it is also these beautiful concepts which make a big difference to our life. Ideas such as beauty, equality, uh, loyalty, freedom, wisdom. They have no existence on their own, but they, they make our life they were useful. Then comes the dreamless state. And that's here, the latent unconscious mind. 
it's very much a part of the mind. So the one who knows this, who can know this? This latent unconscious can only be known by that level deeper, which is the center of unconscious mind. I'm oh, sorry, the center of unconscious center of consciousness, sorry. So center of consciousness knows the deep dreamless state. That deep dreamless state is also part of the mind. You think it's the mind that cognizes, but in reality, the one who cognizes, who knows, is the center of consciousness. The mind is only an instrument. So we don't, we don't use the mind here. I mean, it's the center of consciousness which knows. And because this is such a deep state, most people have not had this experience where they are in deep sleep, yet they are aware. That is the state of yoga nidra. That's, that is also samadhi. Okay. So we stop here, and I hope that was useful. This um, may have been a little bit uh, difficult in parts. But I hope that the use of the examples made it easier to understand. If you read the general books on Yoga Sutras, you will not understand anything. It's impossible to understand. Any of those books which are written by scholars and academicians because they have not practiced, and they have just translated without really understanding what they are translating. So my effort has been throughout with the Yoga Sutras of explaining things in a practical manner, using examples that we can all relate to, and keeping it simple as far as possible. However, there are limitations, certain experiences you've not had, and therefore you will struggle a little bit to relate to them, but that's okay. We try to take as much as we can, and the rest we keep somewhere at the back of the mind, and it will maybe be useful as you continue practicing meditation. And um, it will come up whenever you need it then. All right. Thank you. We end here. Bye-bye. So, bye, everyone.